Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion, media and virtual production, and usually a lot of other things. <laughs> People ask those questions. And the second hour is uh, dedicated to, uh, to something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about the Kilo, the Kilo Show, the thousandth episode uh, that, that we're going to have uh, December 19th. Uh, we're going to have our thousandth episode. We're going to talk about, uh, we might, it might be a little longer than two hours as we kind of look back over a thousand uh, episodes um, uh, over, th over two years. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about what we've, what we've done so far. So uh, we'll talk about if you, if you have ideas, thoughts, questions, you can throw those in for the second hour. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions for the first hour. Mitchell, what do we have? Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. First one in from Greg Gibson in Washington, D.C. Anyone using recurring meetings in Zoom? It appears to be broken. I use a lot of recurring meetings with no fixed time, so I can start them over and over again without changing the link. Now, when I end one, I can't restart it. Seems to be a major bug. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I saw this earlier this morning. Set up a couple quick tests for recurring meetings that are both time started and one that's like an open 24-hour ready to record kind of room and didn't see this behavior. I'm wondering if it were an intermittent thing on the Zoom backend that might have been crossing when you were trying this. Um, but so far, I haven't been able to reproduce it. And we have a lot of recurring meetings ourselves that work. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I would also try to, if, if you're still doing the same one, one of the things I found is the start date of a recurring um, webinar. We got into this little glitch that it just ran out <laughs> like it, it can only go um i think 50 well i know that webinar it turned out can only go out 52 is the is the number we, we went through this big shift in forward and back and in, inside of this infrastructure because i couldn't figure out why it wasn't letting me create a new webinar you know why it wasn't going forward and so i that may be connected to it of, of where, where your start date is you might want to move that back out again um the other thing to i have to admit i start new meeting every Every meeting to me is new. Mostly, I don't. I mean, except for after hours, we <laughs> we keep that the same. But for my meetings, I generally have different ones, and I send people links for them. And it's mostly so people don't come in by accident. I, I never use my personal uh, meeting room, and I never use the same number again because I'm I'm afraid that someone that will accidentally come in that not part of that meeting. And I've been the been the person who jumped into somebody else's meeting a couple times and super uncomfortable. So the just the mere thought that that might happen has me never use the same number again. Um, next question. From Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, guys. If sending an audio signal through a camera into ATAM, then EQing and hijack before streaming out, would there be any latency or drifting issues? If yes, any suggestions to fix the issue? Go ahead, Mitchell. Well, you know it's going to start out uh, synchronous because you're running it through your camera and the camera runs it into HDMI, it goes into ATEM, it goes out, goes in there, comes out. And if you're running uh, audio hijack, it's going to add some latency. The question is, if is, is it enough to throw you off? And typically, uh, rule of thumb, anything over 20 milliseconds will mess with your head. Yeah, go ahead, David. I would say 86 hijack and try EQing it straight in the ATEM stream from there should keep everything in sync. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you get a solid signal, David's absolutely right. If you get a solid signal into the ATEM, it actually has great EQ tools and compression tools and everything that you would probably have in audio hijack. So it, it's got good tools because they're coming from Fairlight. It's the interface that doesn't work. Like if they literally took the, the, the pros and the extremes and added, you know, little X, mini XLRs to that, it would dramatically and be able to take balanced in um, and potentially put a limiter in there or whatever. It would be an incredible um, audio thing. I think a lot more people would use it. Um, it's just that it, it's the it's these little eighth inch unbalanced connections that really and going through the camera, you're going through a, a preamp that isn't isn't very good. <laughs> so so I, would, I I agree. I will say that latency matters less on the if audio is following video latency matters less so you can be off by 20 30 40 milliseconds um on the, with video being ahead of the audio and the reason for that is that video in the real world comes to us uh faster than than audio so sound waves are slower than light by about a millisecond every 10 feet or i'm sorry a millisecond every foot and so we're used to auto correcting for uh, audio being behind video and so it doesn't bother a human that much uh if it's a little off if uh, the only time in the real world 
uh, that that we that audio is coming before video is usually after we ate something that isn't good for us. <laughs> so so it's it's a uh, so it's it's usually a sign of poison, and so it makes us uncomfortable uh, when we look at it. But in the real world, video comes before audio all the time. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I would. Uh, everything said is really true. Uh, I would not split the audio out because to run it through hijack, it has to split that audio stream out of the HDMI signal and make it a separate stream. And then Zoom has to resynchronize it because it's coming in off a different device. So if it comes in over the uh, ATEM video cam webcam driver along with the video where it was residing when it came in, it's more than likely to stay in sync. If you take it out through hijack, it could change the sample rate. It could change a, a lot of things uh, before you bring it back in. So it could drift. So that might be a consideration. So I'd take any external inside the computer uh, machinations out and do the adjustments, like Alex said, inside the ATEM. Next question. David Brady, New York, New York, and here on our panel, is the A10 Mini HDMI line the only devices of Blackmagic design that crushes the blacks when brought into a computer as a webcam? Are there any workarounds with this workflow? This is an ongoing area of contention between Roland and Blackmagic design camps at work. I go ahead, Mitchell. Yes, it does. It does crush them. Um, as I'll do with the partial or full that some devices are expecting, uh, the ATEM puts out a, a full, but some people set it to partial. And uh, if you're going through Zoom uh, without something in between, you're going to have that problem where the blacks get crushed. My blacks are crushed right here. Um, sometimes it looks okay, but uh, if you want to work around it and be very, very precise, um, I think if you use uh, uh, OBS or vMix or any of those programs, you can set the, uh, uh, the receiving of the virtual camera video to be partial or full. Yeah, the problem is, is that most tools don't give you the option to go between, I think it's usually video range and full range, um, you know, and I, and we do believe that what's happening, as Mitch said, is that the ATEM is putting out a full range signal and um, Zoom and many other web um, systems are taking video uh, range rather than full range. And so what that's doing is it's cutting the, you know, it's either scaling or cutting the blacks off and, and that's what's causing that. Um, that issue. And so um, because of the way it's interpreting it, the the way that I handle that um, is that I look at Zoom <laughs> and I make the adjustment uh, to my camera, to my 6K, looking through how it's entering Zoom. So I'm, I'm correcting for the throughput. And you can do that by by just simply raising the blacks up a little bit. So if you push the blacks up just a touch, um, inside the ATEM, you know, for if, if you have a 6K camera, if you can shade the camera, you move that black level up a little bit, then it looks totally normal. But I don't think that there's, you know, we've been asking a couple different folks that do video conferencing to consider um, not doing that. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, like just take, like giving us a little button in video that just says full or, par, you know, full or partial or full in video range on the input, that's what would fix it. And it would be like in the advanced video settings, like we have an advanced audio setting inside of inside of Zoom. I think we, we I think a lot of us would love to have that setting, but it's not something that the ATEM is doing. I mean, it's not crushing the blacks on the way out. It is sending a full range signal, um, which is technically proper. Um, it's just that most things that deal with video are dealing with a video uh, mapping. Now, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, the unfortunate thing is you can correct this with some of the typical color correction settings, but if you're um, getting a signal that's sending full and your system is expecting partial, you'll actually lose data. It won't be as good yeah. as getting the correctly adjusted signal. Um, if, in fact, it's sending a partial signal and you're expecting a full, you can correct it without any losses. Go ahead, David. I guess our our problem too is that we're often playing content back through the ATEM into Zoom via that USB connection. So um, I'll, we'll we'll bring it up and see if we can match things yeah. with some of the rolling guys. Yeah, that's an again. I think that it's again it's both. It'd be nice if the if the ATEM gave you the option of what the output was, video range or full range. And it'd be nice if Zoom gave us that option too. <laughs> so, um, and so we'll we'll see what happens there. Uh, go, uh, next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas, has a question for us. What are good habits around technology, and how do you reduce stress caused by tech devices? 
For example, radiation, posture, eye strain, radiation. How do you know when you have too much tech? How do you keep from over-equipping yourself? Go ahead, David. I mean, the one thing I do is step away every once in a while. You know, after X number of hours in front of things, my eyes start hurting, and I have to look into the distance and uh, pull the things out of my ears so I can clear everything out. So little little breaks every now and then help, um, and I highly recommend doing it from time to time. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. For me, it's been a combination of two things. I tier my equipment. If it's under maybe 75 or 100 bucks for my whole career, those things are consumables kind of to me. And that's where I find myself with the most problem. I have boxes of little things that I bought to try to solve a problem because it was so easy to do. And I just add more and more small technology gizmos that way. When you get above that range, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I find it easier. And in the old days, because equipment was more expensive than it is now, I would find that unless I really was sure it was going to work into my workflow, I would always rent for probably six months, depending on how big a client it was that I thought needed that device, and only make the purchase when I realized that I was losing money by continuing to rent it in an ongoing stream. Sadly, now there's that group of stuff in the middle that's not so far outside of my consumable range, and it's not so far up in the top of the range that it's really easy to just overbuy and get too much stuff. You just have to be be really serious about that. In terms of yep. posture, get a good chair and eye strain, make mm -hmm. sure that all of your angles are correct and that you don't have things up too much. Hey, go ahead, Mitchell. I'm with David Brady. I think it makes sense to do that, especially the eye strain thing where you got to get a distant shot. And if I get too much gear, um, a little tin foil on the head didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, uh, eyesight is important, and and I've developed back problems like a dowager's hump or a programmer's hump. Now they they call it they updated it <laughs> from leaning over working on a keyboard uh, for a long period of time. And if your eyesight as you get older, and I know Paul, you're my age or older, uh, <laughs> your eyesight you can't focus as closely anymore, and people tend to get computer glasses. Uh, but if your computer glasses correct your vision uh, so, <laughs> so that, it, oh, gesundheit, John, uh, <laughs> correct your vision uh, to a narrow plane, um, then you find you're having to lean in to get everything and focus on the, the uh, computer when you're working on it. That tends to to make you work at a specific distance. So have uh, glasses created that are set at different focal distances so that as you lean in or lean back, it'll still be in focus and that'll take some of the strain off your back. And like we said earlier, get up, walk around and focus in the far distance every now and then it keeps your eyes strained down. My, mo my mobile devices are all set to as warm as they'll go. The blue bothers, I found bothered me. felt like it was slowly pushing a hole into my head. Um, I move my monitor away from me, so it's now three feet away, which is much nicer uh, for for me. Um, and I turn off notifications, all of them. Like I don't have any notifications ever. My my phone is on do not. Uh, every device is on do not disturb. Uh, I go to schedule things like period. Like it's almost unless you're a family or a producer and we're in a, in a in a show, I won't even pick up the phone. And if you call me and I haven't and you're not in my message, you're not in my my phone Rolodex, I block you. Like any any number that shows up that I haven't seen before, I just block, 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 block because you're unscheduled call. <laughs> you know, so so the uh, so um, you know that's the biggest thing that keeps stress out for me is is not you know being very. Uh, our world has become like everybody can just chit, chit 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 at you, and I've I've turned most of that stuff off. Um, next question. Nigel Dussau from Austin, Texas, asks, "What Black Friday sale are you waiting for?" Go ahead, Nigel. So, I mean, I'm happy to take Cyber Monday as well, but everything I want is not going to go on sale. So I wondered, but I am worried that the impulse purchase will get the best of me. So I'm <laughs> interested to know what impulse purchases or things people are looking for so I can keep an eye for them. I bought a fridge. I talked about that the other day. So, or I'm buying a fridge. I bought a fridge. It's not just showing up, but it was Black Black Friday. So I saved like 25%, which is a lot for that fridge. Um, the um, uh, I also... I have enough TVs, but I really am like, I really want an 85 inch TV. <laughs> like I have a 75 inch TV and I'm kind of like, mm. so if there's the right kind of TV, if an LG, you know, C1 was on some kind of sale, I might be tempted. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, unfortunately, my main uh, TV in the living room had the unfortunate problem of dying three weeks before Black Friday and I had to replace it. Uh, so... I missed out on getting those cheap 75-inch uh, 
4K TVs that are going on sale uh, throughout See, the world here on Black Friday for under thousand dollars. You just didn't wait. You, you just didn't wait them out. See, my fridge died months ago. My fridge died months ago, and I just we just limped along without a freezer for for, for a while for a long time. Um, anyway, uh, so I could get the Black Friday sales and save money. Uh, next question. Mark Giuliani from Washington, D.C., and I think he's here on the panel. Uh, when playing back video on a HyperDeck, which Apple ProRes should I choose? Mitchell. I would use 422 HQ. Um, seems to work fine. It's a good balance between going all the way up, and the HyperDeck seems to uh, chew it up nicely. If you're if you're doing it into Zoom, you're not going to see any difference in Zoom between LT and, and HQ. It just depends on what you're playing out to. So uh, Zoom's going to compress it down. You're not going to see any any difference at all. We've actually done quite a few tests in this area. The HQ becomes really useful, um, as Mitchell suggests, when you're starting to go into into higher bit depths. So if you're if you need a 10 bit image to look really good, then you need to start HQ is kind of the entry level for 10 bit, um, and but at 8 bit. The 422 is fine. And if you're playing back stuff that was previously compressed, like an H264, then LT is going to be fine. Don't ever use proxy. Proxy is basically saying, I don't care about this footage. It's, it's really a proxy. <laughs> like it is not a, it is not a, a light playback um, format. It is a proxy. And you should never show it in public <laughs> because it's horrible. Um, so, so that's the only uh, that's the only thing I would suggest there. The most important thing, of course, with Hyperdex is to keep them all the same. Um, you want to have even if it says four two two on two different files, I run it through compressor to make it that four two two because uh, uh, Hyper the Hyperdex will look at the first file and every it will not see any other file that isn't identical bit for bit, channel for channel, everything. It just won't. It just doesn't show up. So. I have a I have a, a compressor setting. I throw them in. They just all they all come out at four two two or four two two LQ or, or HQ or whatever it is, um, or LT. But I have those settings, and I, everything gets conformed to those as they go through. Um, next question. Colin McCahey from Dublin, Ireland, has a question. I've been playing with SPX graphics. Anyone used Lupic to create animations and import them into SPX? No. But I think that part of that is that we didn't know until today. Sometimes these questions come up, and it, and the reason we don't have an answer is because we haven't seen them before. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm now, uh, oh wow, yeah, it looks really cool. Um, so we'll we'll take we'll take a closer look at it. Maybe you throw that into a second hour suggestion. Maybe we'll get them on and have them show what they're doing. Uh, next question, Tim Hom from San Lorenzo, California. Uh, Tim asks Panasonic HC2000 with XLR in. Going through a Hollyland, then a splitter, then into Roland VR50 HD. How does the audio get out of sync, even though everything is going through HDMI cables? I could, David. I, I'm pretty sure every time it hits any sort of processing, it's going to throw some some degree of uh, desync. I know at work, we're on an SDI workflow, and we'll usually run things through a stack of uh, converters and everything, and it's usually about three frames, what we notice from one to the next. So I don't know if, if all the splitting, et cetera. And you see three frames of loss, even though it's embedded all the way through on each one of those? Sometimes devices. we have, yeah. We'll do it through, usually through some Folsom scalers and, mm -hmm. you know. But the Folsom, does the Folsom take audio? We have a few that do, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have an FS1 at the end to just kind of adjust everything back in, so. Folsom's, the Folsom's used to never take audio. I, I think I was I was on the older, the older ones, the um, Image Pros. They've, yeah, they have the Image Pro, they have a few lines, and there's one with AES inputs, um, another one, right. you know, all sorts of flavors, but they're they're workhorses, man. Oh, they're, they're just as, we had two of them, and it just meant that in any show, uh, you could fix things. Like you can take, oh, you got a VGA, DVI, uh, HDMI, whatever it was, you got an image coming in, I can pull it in and I can turn it into something that looks like video. They're, they're kind of amazing boxes. They're really expensive, though. I mean, I, I don't remember what they were, but they were like what, four or six thousand dollars, something like that. Um, That's next question: fifteen thousand dollars. I had a ninety-five hundred. Oh, <laughs> there we go. We've got uh, the older, big. It's like a four RU uh, Screen Pro two thing with a bunch of buttons for doing keying and uh, super yeah. sources on that thing. It's it's a beast. Yeah, yeah. I had um, yeah. I never went past the the, the one U. The Image Pros. I think were all we had. Uh, next question. 
James Hutchinson from Dublin, Ireland asks, can the panel recommend a brand of HDMI 2.1 cables capable of 4K 120 hertz over 4 to 6 meters, ideally available to purchase in Europe? Thanks. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, I don't know if they have Amazon in Europe. But these I've used some of these high wing. Oops, sorry. High wings. You can get them on Amazon uh, if they got them there. And they these are rated for 8K um, 60 or 4K 120 if you should be crazy enough to try and send 120 4k over any length of time they're available up to 15 feet but i don't think much longer than that so you got your three meters there but i wouldn't run it any longer than that without going to optical yeah tom another plus one for the high wings i use a number of these uh, 4k hdmi cables in my system because i moved my atm over into a rack and uh, Mitchell? It's surprising how different HDMI cables can be. Some will work with some cameras or uh, monitors, and some will not, uh, even though they claim all the specs that we're talking about. Uh, Gerald Undone does a great uh, YouTube on the difference between them and uh, which ones work well. And, of course, he uh, is represented by Condor Blue, which makes blue, and in Gerald's case, purple braided HDMI cables of all sizes and shapes, and they're all checked to be 100% accurate and guaranteed. I know it sounds like a softball question, but uh, I, uh, I liked what he had to say about them. I just got this um, uh, Condor Blue, actually. I didn't know that Gerald, Gerald did that, but but the uh, this is this is actually, I don't know if it, it'll do the 120. It's not... It's, it's got braided cable, which is important, but it is, um, this is HDMI on one side and it, and it's like the smallest, I haven't tested it yet. It's been sitting here for a little while. Cause I broke down my, when it, when it showed up, I was breaking down my studio. Um, but it is, uh, USB-C on one side and HDMI in on the other side. So theoretically this could be the smallest, um, digitizer for a, for an HDMI signal that I've ever seen. And we'll, uh, we'll play with it a little bit in the future. Um, yeah, the, um, let us know, James, if you actually get somewhere with 120. Uh, I think that over the next um, two years, next year or two, we're going to need to know a lot about 120 frames a second. Next question. Next one in from Nathan Cashian from Oregon City. Telehealth offerings have grown widely since the pandemic. Would there be a market for helping healthcare providers improve their telehealth setup? Is anyone doing something similar? Good, Bill. I'm sure there's a very large market for it. Yes, almost every doctor's office and hospital system is moving into this. You're going to have some deep competition, though. They already understand that particularly HIPAA compliance and things like that are incredibly important to them. So the security aspects of passing along any medical information gets more and more important every day. Uh, my doc and pocket doc and things like that are doing a lot of work in this in the uh, iOS and other uh personal device spaces because a lot of doctor visits are happening that way now just for efficiency. Good, Mitchell. Yeah, it seems like all the medical uh, organizations want to have their own portal, uh, their own login, and they don't want to use uh, anything, Zoom, Teams, you name it. And um, when I went in with my doctor during the uh, uh, pandemic, um, I came in with this basic image and he went, whoa! <laughs> and then I played theme music and did all this stuff. But uh, I, I think that there can be an improvement. One of the improvements might be just to standardize on something that we all use. Courtney? Yeah, I just finished work on video just this week for a, uh, a large insurance company healthcare facility that does telehealth. And they have uh, their collaboration rooms built into all of their office spaces uh, that are designed for doing video conferencing and telehealth visits. Uh, some some of the doctors have it set up in their offices. And of course, they're not going to do good lighting in their offices because they don't want to add any instruments and things that kind of get in the way and take away from the person, you know, the personal interaction with your office uh, when people do come into the office. So they don't want to make it uh, too intrusive uh, for the live live in person meetings. So uh, they kind of have to live with the lighting that's there, but they do have fairly good quality cameras and the sound is, uh, they bring in a special, you know, microphones on the desk that are designed for doing uh, teleconferencing. So they, they are taking care to do this stuff and spending some money. Yeah. The, um, uh, the I saw one, I don't, I don't, there wasn't a, a regular doctor. It was like a, I mean, it was just someone that we were talking to about um, that we brought them into an event 
And what their room did is they had a, cur a curved ceiling, just a little bit curves on the end, and all the way around they had these super bright lights that just lit up the ceiling. Because we asked them to, when we were bringing them in, we asked them to point up because I was trying to figure out how the light was so nice. You know, like how is their light so nice? They're they're you know coming in from pretty, uh, and they and that's what they did is they built all the way around the edge. They built these they they put these high powered you know LED lights around it. And then they had it just as a slight curve on it. And it just is this giant soft box above them. And it looked really, really nice. And I realized that might be a way for, you know, some people to put into their infrastructure something that doesn't have a bunch of light around, but just creates a nice big soft light that they, they just looked really, I mean, it didn't look like it was artsy. It just looked like they were in a really big cloudy day. And <laughs> it was quite nice. Um, so I, it was, it definitely had me start to think about it. I do think that there's going to be a big business in going out and talking to people about their pipelines. I... As a test yesterday, I didn't actually cook, but I, you know, we since we did all this cooking, I did a, uh, I, I signed up for Sir Latab, um, you know, one of their little tapa like how to do, you know, online, just to see what they did. And what I will say is that I, what I noticed was their, so the talent, uh, the woman that was teaching tapas was top notch, like just knew how to talk about it, knew how to show you how to do it, knew how to do it, understood what she needed to do with Zoom. But they were at 360p with two cheap webcams and a horrible headset. <laughs> and I was just like, you could do better. That's all I'm saying. You, you could, it wouldn't take very much to up, upgrade this. And so um, I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for a lot of us to go out and help people. Someone should help them. And we should. what we should do is we should all jump into one of their shows with our kits in our <laughs> kitchen. Because it's all like people with their laptop open, you know, pointed upward. Um, you know, so we should just pick a Sir Latab and come in like loaded for bear. Quality just, bombing. What? Quality but, bombing. And yeah, quality. Go in and quality bomb the show. We gotta be able to zoom things and, and do quality bombing. Like just suddenly we just show up with a whole bunch of multi-cam rigs with short, and start asking questions. And we've got great audio and great video. I was like, it would get them. I think it might get them thinking that maybe this would Bring be Bring in a Zoom room, bump it to 720p. Yeah, yeah. That would yeah. <laughs> do overhead cameras. <laughs> Let me show you what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're gonna make a plan on that, you know. Every, you know, multi-camera, high-quality Zoom room, and just be like these people showed up, and suddenly everything was great, you know. So we'll figure out one. It's way off in the distance, so that we can, because I think they only put in like twenty people. So, all right, all right. So stand by for that. All right, next question. Kenny Hampton from Greenville, Illinois, is here. Alex, if you're using the Insta360 Link camera today, how do you accomplish the shallow depth of field effect with the background blurred a bit? Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Every item on that shelf behind uh, Alex has already been pre-blurred. Yeah, exactly. It's there's just a, a sheet there. It's just a printout, and we just blurred it. Everything's out. in Vaseline. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, it, this is a uh, Black Magic 6K. That's what that's what I'm using here with a 24 to 70 Canon L series uh, set to 2.8. And so we did. I did have a. I put another lens on that allowed me to go to 1.8. It was actually a really cheap 50 millimeter lens. And uh, it felt there's two problems. One is, is that it was too blurred in the background. You couldn't really see anything about what was there. And number two um, is that I was constantly like looking over at this monitor to see if I was in focus because the, the depth of field was so short. Um, the other thing that's, that's allowing it to um, uh, be out of focus is that it's a solid eight feet behind me. So it's, it's way back there, um, which makes it uh, a little easier to, to drop out of focus. Next question. Colin Mulcahy from Dublin, Ireland asked, I've been asked to shoot a music video at our studios. They want a smoke dry ice carpet to cover the floor just below the knee of the single performer. What should I be hiring to achieve this effect? Anything to watch out for? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I don't know who you'd hire to do it. It's quite easy to get. To a hire a hire from. in the UK is, is it's a rent. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know that a lot needs to be rented, but uh, when you're doing it, I recommend closing all the doors or setting up a barrier at the base of a door if it has to be open. Uh, you'd fill it with everyone in place, crew and cast, and you'd backlight the fog so that it's enhancing its appearance mm -hmm. because front lighting fog doesn't really work. Yeah. But I can't, for the UK, recommend any source for getting yeah. the equipment to do this. Good, Bill. So the traditional way to do this is a machine called a dry ice fog machine. Usually it starts out with a 55 gallon drum. They put a small heating element in it. And I'll say you have to be careful of that. And let me tell you in a minute. But 
Uh, and then it has a basket that you load with dry ice because you don't want it charged until you're ready to use it. And if it's in kind of a theatrical circumstance. So at some point, and it takes a couple of minutes to build up a head of uh, dry ice fog in there. There's a fan and usually a really large diameter tube coming out to stage side. In the best implementations I have where they're doing something like Brigadoon on stage and they've got to get it covered in a scene change in a minute and a half, sometimes there's two or even three machines backstage. So at the proper time when the, the, the scene before it ends, they dump all the dry ice, they turn on the fans, which are pretty low flow fans because you don't, you know, dry ice fog is wispy. And if you have too much wind on it, it'll just dissipate. So those low volume fans will just start churning out the fog because it is colder than the ambient temperature. It'll stay down on the floor and you get that beautiful uh, floor of fog effect. And the volume and the amount of time you have to charge up the system and get it out there will determine how high up it comes. So that's why you usually have multiple on, on different wings of the stage. That's how Good. we did it in theater. Good, Courtney. Uh, yeah, what uh, what Bill said is the typical way. Use the these foggers use uh, ethylene glycol these days. They used to use uh, oil, uh, mineral oil, and crack it, and then send it over the dry ice to keep it hanging low. And it, the cracked oil would hang around a lot longer than the ethylene glycol, uh, but it had the problem of it condenses out into leaving a fine oil sheen on top of all floors and it becomes extremely dangerous because if you have any kind of dancers or performers they're going to slip and fall down and sue you so uh what a lot of uh, a lot of professional uh situations have turned to is liquid nitrogen which has its own dangers uh you know our air is 90 you know 90 nitrogen or 70 percent nitrogen anyway so it's not toxic but it uh, does displace oxygen. So you gotta be careful. If you got somebody working low in the fog, they're gonna be in 100% nitrogen down there since it's hanging low, because it's so cold. Uh, they use the liquid nitrogen because it, it does, as you described, forms a nice carpet right along the floor if the room is uh, you know, uh, heated to a comfortable 70 degrees or so. Uh, but, and it dissipates fairly quickly. So you have to continuously feed it to keep it uh, there because it, uh, mixes into the air and the condensation uh, disappears fairly quickly. And that's why it's used in a lot of stage shows because it won't pollute the audience. And as soon as you turn it off, it'll dissipate in just a few seconds. Yeah, and one to look at, I haven't used it, but we almost got one for one a project that we did is a Chave, um, Chave DJ makes a Cumulus, which is an oil-based uh, system that is uh, ground hugging. Uh, so, um, so d definitely check that out as well. Next question. Next question in from Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C. If you had to present a 10-minute VR video of a potential project to a client and potential investor over Zoom, would you play the movie over the computer you're using, another computer through an ATEM, or use a hyperdeck presenting at 1 p.m. Eastern? Go ahead, Mitchell. I would do it over the hyperdeck. And uh, the only tip I would give you, Mark, would be make sure you f reformat the uh, uh, the SD card before you start it. And make sure you use uh, one file that the thing will play back and test and test and test. You go, Courtney. Yeah, I would use the hyperdeck as well. If you're going to use a, a computer, use a separate computer and make sure that computer uh, has enough guts to play it back. If it's a laptop, you know, you'll probably have to be playing back at H.264. It may not be able to play back. Uh, ProRes, unless it's a Mac. Uh, so take all that stuff into consideration, but the HyperDeck can automatically queue it up to start playing as soon as you switch to it. So that's another convenient thing. Yeah, if you don't have the Jog and Shuttle on the HyperDeck, you may want to think about the Jog and Shuttle version of the HyperDeck or a Jog and Shuttle available for the HyperDeck. You may want to consider some kind of uh, play out software because you may want to scrub back and forth um, while they're talking. So without being able, a regular HyperDeck, well, that will be pretty difficult to do well. So um, so you may want to think about some other playback like, uh, I mean, everything from uh, MIDI uh, to, you know, a QLab or to, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of different options there. So, but 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 think about those because that's, um, uh, I think that you, you're going to, they're going to ask questions and you're going to want to get to a point quickly. And I think the hyperdeck might be challenging in that way if you don't have the jog and shuttle. Next question. Joe Andrews from Lebanon, Oregon. I currently cut a small live Q&A show with Ecamm and Zoom ISO on an M1 Mac Mini. Currently only streaming live to Facebook via Zoom, but want to add live via YouTube and LinkedIn stream. Should I buy another Mac or dedicated hardware to handle the stream? Go ahead, David. 
I would subscribe to Restream.io and aggregate it right there from Zoom. Use a custom live streaming service, send it to Restream, configure Restream for your final destinations, and you should be good to go. That's what I do every week at Sundays. Yep. Go ahead, uh, Josh. Yeah. Plus one on David's uh, comment. The reason you want to do that is you'll have half the bandwidth if you do it that way. Yep. All right, go ahead, uh, Tony. I'm going to suggest uh, vMix. Uh, even though I don't have Windows application, but we are doing uh, LinkedIn Live through vMix. Uh, and it's so far, we've had two great weeks of using uh, YouTube and LinkedIn Live simultaneously. Great. Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, depending on if the uh, viewers justify it on Facebook, at least uh, using vMix with the API, you can get 1080 out of uh, vMix and it looks much better than the 720p. So I'd suggest uh, if you can get a PC with vMix and output. Them. Yeah, and, and all I'll say is that you know, we're going to do multiple platforms very soon. As soon as we get some of the other stuff that we're working on done, we're going to push it out to a bunch of platforms. Uh, but we're mostly doing it so we can test how they look and how they work um, and what what kind of response and kind of be able to compare things. Uh, when I talk to clients, I almost always try to talk them out of putting the same content on multiple platforms because it fragments their audience. And it's easier to use those other platforms to drive them to one platform that is going to be the one that you interact with. So I will use all those other platforms typically to push them to YouTube. And the reason for that is that YouTube has the most stable and highest quality live streaming. Uh, next question. Next question, Andy Kokendorfer from VR Florida weighs in. Who is your source for custom Pelican case inserts? Good guy. Yeah, the one that we've seen at a couple shows is uh, My Case Builder, and uh, I'll put the link in the chat. The one that I just started uh, reselling and the one that uh, I just got for my Red Komodo is a uh, one by Jason Cases. Uh, so Jason Cases looks like this, where they're already uh, pre-cut out. So for Blackmagic cameras, Canon cameras, Movies, uh, you can see that they're nicely labeled, and um, you got spots for your batteries and lenses, and it they fit really nice and they're built really well. So I take a look at those. I'll put the link to both. Next question. Colin McCahey from Dublin, Ireland. With Insta360 Link, what image settings, if any, have you adjusted to get the best results? Uh, I turn off auto, um, the auto exposure and the auto um, uh, color or the uh, color temperature immediately. <laughs> like I just turn them off. That way I can figure out what I want. And and they have great tools to do that. They even have a curves that you would see in Photoshop to um, adjust contrast and so on and so forth. So that's the very first thing that I do is get rid of those, get rid of those extra things and stick with, uh, but, you know, doing it manual because they have the tools to do it really well. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, could you use Mimo Live in between the A10 Mini and Zoom to correct the blacks in software? You could. The problem is, is that you're now taking, as Josh had, had mentioned earlier, you're taking a already compressed footage and trying to stretch it back out again. Um, so you, you, you could do it, but you're going to cut it off. You're going to cut some stuff off and then you're going to raise it up. Um, what I'm talking about is raising up the camera output that goes into the can it goes goes through the system and you'll end up with more data that way go ahead josh yeah i'm not sure about uh, mimo live i know um the correction it happens if it has the same thing that obs has you can actually set it to full or partial color range so you won't lose it on that case in that case but it will add something else in your pipeline in order to negotiate that uh, you know uh one thing that you may want to think about is is possibly doing something that would adjust the blacks before it got to the ATEM would be probably, uh, but, but you might be able to put something in between. It could, because it's not getting, uh, Douglas might be onto something. You, po you possibly could make that adjustment in another app on the way through because it's coming through as full and you have to recompress it on the way through. What you need to do that um, is uh, a good, you need a good color chart <laughs> to, pass through that so that you can compare both of those at the same time in in there to make sure that they're exactly the same. Uh, go ahead, Bill. 
And Douglas, I know you're really uh, interested in these things. So you might want to do some research under what was called pedestal level when they were setting black in the early days, as they made the transition from analog to video. Uh, we used to have a pedestal level that was around, I think it's 7.163 or something like that, IRE, that was different between the digital standard and the analog standard. Uh, yeah. When Sony started doing cameras, they, they crushed it down to zero. And I think some of this confusion comes from that original thing. So do some reading on that. You might find it fascinating, pedestal level. Yeah. Next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. Bo has a question. After Jason mentioned the Zima board yesterday, I'm looking at it as a Raspberry Pi alternative. What types of services do you run on mini PCs in your productions? Network monitoring, web scraping, et cetera. We have so many different ones. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, SPX graphics, uh, companion. Well, yeah, so the services that we're running on, yeah, so we're using, um, we have SPX, we have Companion, we have Isadora, we have, um, oftentimes we have extra windows, so um, any of scopes, um, you know, every one of those is another little computer that's doing something. I think that we have, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct, I think we have nine PCs for this show <laughs> you know, that, are, that are feeding in a variety of different things and doing a variety of different services. Uh, next question. Next question coming in from Angelo Jack in Brooklyn, New York. Any thoughts on new Stream Deck Plus? How can we use it to improve uh, your production? Uh, go ahead, Tom. I've already seen an implementation on uh, DaVinci Resolve where they're using it for color correction and so forth, but I'm waiting for the companion folks to uh, get in there and start doing things with perhaps even a MIDI interface. I don't know. I think this thing uh, has a whole lot of potential. Yeah, there's already folks building some tools for Resolve so that you can start managing your color and a lot of other other settings there. I saw some video on it already that they're you know they're building a a Stream Deck setup for that and other. I think we're going to see a lot of those. I think it's a huge. I, what I'm hoping is this is the beginning of them adding two rows or making it wider. And like if it's successful, I think that they're going to go there because having some dials along with the buttons is. It's pretty lethal, you know, and and so I think that it's going to be a really exciting thing to see where they go with that. A lot of us use the old um, Behringer had like I think it was a B at BSC two thousand or something like that. There was a mixture of dials and buttons, and and we used it with MIDI to actually control Hangouts and everything else. And having all that analog interface was was really nice. If you add the the um, scribble pad that that's on on across the top of those dials along with buttons that you that that can keep on changing in state it's pretty it's pretty interesting yeah go ahead tom well the, it's a lot deeper than it looks because you start looking at it and it's got eight buttons no wait the uh, dials are also buttons and wait again so is the touch screen so really you have actually 16 places you can tap and change things but then the dials go multi-deep so i think it's got a lot of potential uh, next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. Aerie released Alexa monochrome cameras. Why is this a benefit over full color sensors? I go ahead, Courtney. Well, because you get uh, much more light sensitivity because they've basically taken their regular sensor and removed the buyer filter that's in front of it that filters each uh, 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 sensitive site on the um, chip to red, green, and blue. So they pull that out and they also pull the infrared filter out. And so you get uh, uh, three pixel sites to generate one pixel of output. They, they come out at the same resolution, but they use three sensor sites to generate that one uh, black and white pixel that's going out. So you have three times the sensitivity for that individual area. Uh, and so it gives you, and because they remove the infrared filter as well and the bare filter, uh, it makes uh, green, you know, uh, plants look kind of white and silky. It, it has a unique look to it. it. Looks like the old panchromatic film, um, and that's why it pays to use that rather than to just remove the chroma from a regular, a regular sensor Alexa that has RGB bare filters in it. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I think there's a certain aesthetic thing. Even photographers at the working at the high end, there's a lot of them that highly prize the look of shooting in black and white to the point where they will dump two channels and work on one of the channels. And if you can get all the sensors working together to create the maximum amount of signal information uh, and just work in monochrome, 
I think that can be a beautiful look. I mean, look at films like Young Frankenstein that came out in the color era, and they just said, I love this look, I want it. The, yeah, I think that the the fact that, you know, because we have to remember that all those colors is with the Bayer filter, we have to remember that all those colors are coming in at different locations. Like everything is soft. Everything that comes through a color camera with a CMOS filter is soft, you know, and then we use sharpening to pull it back, you know, to what we think is okay. This would not require that. It's, um, it's a pretty interesting camera. Next question. Craig McFarlane from Boston, Massachusetts. Has anyone received the new Stream Deck with touch bar and dials? If not, is yours arriving soon? Go ahead, Tom. Well, of course, you just saw mine, and I saw one from uh, Dr. John Edelson, often on our panel. So uh, they're in the wild. You go ahead, John. Yesterday, <clears throat> yesterday was Chris Fenwick's birthday, and we all pitched in, and we bought him one. We don't know. <laughs> We don't know what he's going to use it for yet, but Chris has one as well. I'm waiting for it to arrive. So we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to talk about it soon. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, GM is mandating salaried workers return to office three days a week starting January 2023. One justification is more efficient communication and casual mentoring. With Zoom spots and community building tools like those, uh, does this still hold? Go ahead, David. I think it does being one of the guys, you know, I work at a big corporation and we are slowly going back to the office. Uh, Zoom spots has a lot of potential for that kind of split between on-prem and off-prem, having that kind of ad hoc uh, place to just communicate with people. So it's going to be a challenge 2023. I'm looking forward to it. And because it's going to challenge, I forget the formula, but challenge is going to drive innovation. So there we go. Good, good, Courtney. Yeah, I think it's better for for a collaboration. However, you know, they may have picked the wrong time to do it because we're headed back into a COVID spike. And now there's, I just heard this morning on the television that they're going back to some masking requirements at some large corporations. So they have picked the wrong time to do it. Yeah, Bill? In the big business schools, I was shocked. I was working with the CEO once and he said, uh, yeah, I'm going to go do some MBO. And I said, what is MBO? And he said, management by wandering around. I guess they actually talk about that as a process just to get out into the troops and make yourself available so that you can hear things and kind of be more integrated into the, the thing. So I'm not at all surprised that CEOs and people in the C-suite want more of that. They probably feel cut off a little bit. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2023. I think that there's a kind of a one, two, three punch, which is that we all got pretty good at things and used to a certain thing during COVID. COVID is now coming back along with RSV, along with the flu. So there's going to be a lot of like pushback on, hey, I don't really want to be around all these people right now. Um, and people getting sick and, and being pretty upset about it that they got pulled. The rough part of the I told you so will be if people get pulled back to, to work and then get really sick, they're going to sue the, they're going to, the, the thing is they're going to sue the company. Like that they were, if they are forced back to work and they get RSV, not even COVID, um, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits. You know, as a, as a son of a lawyer, I can tell you, there's a lot of lawyers just waiting for this to happen. They're just going to pounce on them. And so it's going to be, it's, it could cost millions and millions of dollars to force employees back during this winter. Um, and the, um, the uh, other thing that's going to happen is, is that, you know, we're, we're probably going to go into a recession. I've never seen so many companies so worried about a, an economy ever before it happened. You know, usually they're responsive and the, we see the thing, but for everybody to pull back before next year's, I don't even know what's going on. Like, I don't, like, I can't measure it, but there's something going on that they're all worried about. Um, uh, online, you know, Zoom streaming is counter cyclical. It expands during uh, slow times because people are trying to do more with less. And so, so we'll, it'll be a really interesting time. I think that it, it could be the kind of the death knell of, that, but I also think it depends on what you're doing. It's whether it's, you know, are you doing a GM is a physical thing. It's hard to be on Zoom. Uh, software development is a is not hard to do over Zoom. So it just depends on the company too. Next question. Colin Mulcahy in Dublin, Ireland with Insta360 Link. Am I right in saying that you can adjust its view remotely for a client? If so, how do you access the remote link camera? Go ahead, Mitchell. In Zoom, if you request camera control with an Insta360, you have control. And currently it looks like you have con basic control. So pan, tilt, zoom, so you can make adjustments to it. If you really want control, what you need to do is send out a computer with some kind of screen sharing, and then you can open up the app and then you would have all the controls. And even though we don't do that for all of them, 
medium to large events that we do, we're still sending computers out. And because we can put, um, we can put all, all kinds of other services on it to make, make it happen. Um, next question. Next question in from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia, and here on our panel. Coming up on two full weeks of using the Shoot Pro app on iPhone XS Max as primary camera source. What does the panel think? I think it looks good. I think it, it I think it, uh, I, I think it, I don't think you're losing anything by using the Shoot app. I think that you've got a lot more features that might be more useful to you than the way that you were using Filmic. Um, so I think that uh, it's a good move. Uh, next question. Samuel Nordvik in uh, Norway asks, I'm trying to remotely control the zoom on a Sony camera with multiport. I want to use an Arduino controller with serial. Do you have any experience or thoughts? I think the, and I, when, it, when you say zoom, I think I'm assuming the zoom function on that, on that camera. And you should be able to do it through the Visca um, protocol. So just about all, well, it depends on a, depends on what the, if the Sony camera has a multi-port, if it's, it should be able to support Visca. Um, and the other thing that a lot of cameras do, and I wouldn't need to know the exact Sony camera that you're using, but the other one would be, you know, a Lank, um, you know, interface. Uh, so Lank or Visca for the smaller Sony cameras. And then of course there's other protocols that are, um, oftentimes harder to get a hold of to do your own thing on the professional cameras. It's actually, one of the reasons we slowly started moving away from the Sony cameras was because we they we knew that there was software to control um, the big cameras, and we knew they weren't giving it to us <laughs> because we saw it. <laughs> you know, like we you know, so uh, only you know only places like ILM had the software, and it really made us crazy that there was software that existed that we weren't allowed to use. Um, you know, it wasn't like they didn't make it; they just didn't give it to us. And so then that led to us um, not buying any more Sony cameras. Uh, next question. From Tim Holm in San Lorenzo, California. Tim asked, Panasonic HC2000 is at 60p, then going into Hollyland, which maintains that frame rate. OBS is streaming at 30. Is it possible that OBS will decouple audio sync? Go ahead, Guy. It'd be OBS, but I'm almost positive that the uh, culprit here is the Hollyland. If it's the Mars 300 or 400, those are going to kick out like 300 milliseconds of uh, latency delay. So you're getting delayed there. I, I bet you that's where it's happening. So I'd take a look at taking that out and just run your test and see what happens. I will say that no, uh, that OBS is notorious for a losing sync. <laughs> like, like it's just like, especially if you're on the Mac, uh, it, it is almost expected that you're going to lose sync in, in OBS um, on a Mac. And uh, it is, a, but it, it, because it's managing, it's managing both the audio and the video in a separate, in separate, once it gets to it, no matter how it gets to OBS, it's managing it as two separate feeds. And so if you're so, if your, if your CPU is going over 60%, um, you will lose frame, you will lose sync. Like that's the, you know, on, on OBS. Um, next question. Paul Valhus, Austin, Texas asked, how good is a LastPass as a launch pad for running all your programs and making online payments compared to one password, which is more Mac friendly, more PC friendly? I think that they're, for most people, both of those are almost interchangeable. Like they're not, they're just not that much different. Uh, I use, a lot of us use one because that's what we started with. So I know a lot of people that use one password. I use LastPass, um, and but I and I know it really well, and it's got everything that I need. I don't use any of the extra features; I just use the password feature. Um, the big advantage that pa one that that I think one password has now that LastPass had was that I could share with other team members a ability to log into a site without giving them the password. So it would automatically log in. So I could share someone in a group, say everyone can log in. And so we were managing someone else's account. I don't necessarily want to give everybody the password. I just want to let them log in. And so that was a key feature of LastPass for a long time that that One Password didn't have because One Password was really more about the individual. Um, I think One Password has included that, but I'm not sure because I still use LastPass. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, "How many ways are you migrating to Mastodon or other similar decentralized social media platforms, and away from Twitter?" None. No ways. <laughs> like, like Mastodon is not going to work. Like it's cute. It's a, it, but it's, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's too geeky. It's too dis decentralized. It's never going to, it, it, if anything, Mastodon will be like a little raft that everyone's on for a little while. And as soon as something else comes up, they're all going to dump it. So you're going to put a bunch of time into something and then you're going to get dumped because no one, Mastodon is just weird. Um, go ahead, Nigel. Learn to use filters, learn to use uh, lists manage and curate your Twitter and it's fine. Yeah, it's, 
the 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 only request I, I mean we were talking I was tweeting about it this morning before the show and and uh, but I just think that they should just go back to the 2007 version give us 280 characters and maybe include uh, ads <laughs> you know, like you know and and and, it, and and the same almost the same number of people would use Twitter because there's not another way to you have to remember that all these people have to rebuild their following on it and it will. And it will be a shell of itself. Like if if a, if someone really big builds a Mastodon server, number one, if they have to manage that, which will be a disaster if they have a million people on it. And number two is uh, it will be a shell of itself if it's just that person in an echo chamber. Um, it's just it, it. And so there's not any replacement for Twitter, really. And I think that it would actually do better if they got rid of all the junk that they've added over the last 10 years or 15 years. Um, go ahead, John. I have I have two I'm running tweet deck on my PC on my 60 inch monitor up here with columns for my channels. It's fantastic. I found out more information on that than anything else. Yeah, I I I don't have any problem. I mean, like I guess again, as as both John and Nigel pointed out, I filter heavily. You know, like I just I filter heavily and I block aggressively. Like if someone if someone just does something that's inappropriate, I just go block that person, block that person, block that person, block that person, and then I have about 150 words that are muted. Um, of think of just issues I'm not really really interested in politics on Twitter because you know people aren't anyway <laughs> people aren't smart enough to usually know what they're talking about. So the so I'm not really interested in listening to their their opinions. And so um, but I have, you know, I have great feeds on from audio engineers and coding engineers and Steeler fans and, you know, all the things that I'm interested in is what my feed looks like. And if you get aggressive about muting and blocking, like just, just, just cut in there with a broadsword and just mute, 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 block, 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 block. You get this incredible feed <laughs> like that is, that is just, and lists as, as Nigel said, and it's just this, it, it's unlike anything else out there. It's just that people keep on using the raw version and be, you know, like, it's just, that's no way to live. That's all I'm saying. Um, next question. From Paul Valahus in Austin, Texas. Wise just rolled out their web view, which is their web interface. Will this make home security more accessible compared to the device apps they've relied on up to now? Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I have uh, the Arlo and uh, the Ring um, doorbell at home and at the office. We uh, put in some of these wise cameras. And uh, thanks, Paul, for the question, because I just went in online and looked at what we got here. And this is the beta version of that wise. So we can see some of the cameras and these supplement our, our other security cameras are a little more powerful where we have some PTZs. But what's neat about this new technology is, is the... Uh, uh, if a car drives by, you'll see like some AI boxes that will appear. Nobody's driving by right now. But the other interesting thing about it is the uh, ability to, to go back and see. Um, come on, let's go back. Uh, back. Okay, there goes a car. Uh, come on, Walmart. There it goes. You see that green bounding box that's, that's appearing? So you, it, it'll show that stuff. And then take a look at this. This is what's cool is that you can go to events and you can sort by, hey, when did a uh, person appear? And now, so yeah, everything's tagged. So I can see that in the uh, upper warehouse, there was a person at 7.45 a.m., 27 seconds. And then you can go back and you can watch that person coming in and you can see the grip bounding box around them. So it's really cool to see all this stuff uh, and sort by it. So like last night, uh, what was going on at you know 11.42 at night. So it looks like a person came across the parking lot What's this guy doing? It looks like he's had too much to drink. So you can just see what's going on. It's really cool, though. I, I mean, for 49 bucks a camera, this is super impressive of what, what uh, Wise is doing. So I'm going to buy some of these for my house as well. So cool stuff. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it's, I've, I have some Wise cameras. I used to monitor my 3D printing and be great. I have to use a little app right now because... Um, and it'd be great to be able to just pop it up on my uh, laptop and be able to look at the cameras without having to take the phone out and look at the app. It does require uh, WiseCam Plus, which is a subscription. It's about $1.67 per camera per month. Uh, and uh, you do have to subscribe to that to use the web-based interface. And that that provides all of the stuff that uh, Guy was just demonstrating there, the bounding boxes and the pet detection and car detection and package detection if you have it on your front front 
doorstep to tell you when the Amazon guy has gotten there. And, it, and so it opens up all those features, but you do have to have that. You have to have a, a more a more recent wise camera uh, 2.1 version of firmware later, I think. Next question. Next question in from Colin Makahi in Dublin, Ireland, waiting for Alex's gear to start sliding off the shelves to the right. It, it's my cat's fault. That's all I have to say is that it was, I straightened it. It was a little crooked yesterday. I straightened it out. My cat jumped up on the back of the, uh, <laughs> jumped up on the, there's a sound blanket on the other side of my camera, jumped up on it, pushed it, and it went like this just a little bit right before the show. So um, I'm going to blame it on the cat, but it will be fixed probably by tomorrow. So it's, yeah, it's, it's little things. Uh, it's a problem. It's usually why I try to avoid straight lines because that's, that's exactly what you get. Like long straight lines, you have to either get it just right or, or it doesn't work. So anyway, that's, uh, there's, there's that. Okay, we're jumping into the second hour um, and uh, talking about the thousandth show. We've got about a month to think about this. Not a lot of time uh, to really think about all the things we might want to do. Um, I, I do want to let everybody know I'm taking the day off. <laughs> so I will be, uh, I don't know how long we're going to go, um, but it probably will be more than two hours. Uh, so you might want to think about um if you're really into this you might want to think about what that what that looks like for you uh you might want to stop in and out we're, what we're thinking about is trying to figure out a way to let you know what's going on during the day so that you can decide whether you want to come in or not um josh do you want to give everyone a little bit of an overview of uh, what you guys are working on sure so just hold on a second we're gonna have a thousand shows on the books on december 19th let that sink in. So we've got something really to show. And for a lot of us, we came in, if we're not uh, one of the few um, OGs that have been here since day one, we've come in at different times. So a lot of us are interested in the story. What happened before we came here? What shows happened? You know, who were the people? What, how how was the production? Did we come in in 1.0 or we you know, come in a little later in production. So some historical things of uh, people being able to tell the story about, you know, uh, what what office hours was like for them, giving personal experiences. So the purpose of this show is really to um, raise awareness for um, having this show, but also for um, for people that are looking to contribute. So we've got, um, Alex has said, we've got an open-ended uh, time to be able to share things. So. Um, what what uh, type of screenshots or what um, uh, timestamps can you share with us in YouTube videos? If you want, to, by the way, if you want to share a video with us, um, you can go into and share that point in the video. There's a way to do it, uh, even on the mobile phone. You share at this point in time, or a little share button. You can put in uh, a little uh, indicator that can take us right to the little morsel that you want us to, to have. We have some um, editors that have signed up to help us to curate things, but if you'd like to make something and submit that, we have our, um, uh, if you look in the email, there is a um, contribution uh, part under team opportunities. There's um, let us know the OH Killer Show thread in Discord. So that'll take you right to the public thread where everyone can put their suggestions, their comments, uh, things they'd like to participate. Um, so what would you like to see? Uh, what are you interested in? Um, what was your perspective coming into office hours? Um, what was, what did it mean to you? Um, we're here to sort of get ideas uh, about what our segments we're going to be working on for the next four weeks. Um, what should we spend our time curating? Um, so we'll find out what your ideas are for these. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, maybe we ought to borrow some of that hardware infrastructure that Blue and Grant use for those Tony Robbins seminars and put a thousand people up on the screen at one time for a thousand show. It'd be <laughs> nice to see all the former panelists that, you know, have come and gone over the years and and also see the faces, even if they're only just saying hello uh, and are happy 1000th show to all the producers out there who are never been brave enough to be on the panel, but submit their questions all the time. It'd be nice to, to connect a face with all those names we hear and those questions every day. Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm working on an unsolved mystery. It'll be about Mickey Makachor, often heard, rarely seen, sort of in the wild. So that'll be my contribution. Go ahead, Tony. I am... Uh... 
amazed at this journey. I, I probably have been one of one of the old heads that that's been around for a while. And I uh, I was one of those people who found office off found office hours after they were dealing with personal um issues and from the standpoint of uh just recovering from being treated for cancer. And uh one of the amazing things about me finding office hours at the time in which I did was that the really good thing was that I was so awful um, with my appearance and the community was <laughs> very comfortable with welcoming me in. And what that did was that helped me help a small congregation in Macon, Georgia, actually have a global ministry. And it's, it's less than 20 people. And yet they are able to share their ministry globally. And it's less than 20 people. So I think that that is amazing. And I think that one of the and things then, that we, we have talked about a little bit there is that is that that's the kind what you're talking about right now is the kind of thing that we're going to probably reach out for for the actual show itself, um, you know, and and look for you know, 30 second clips or whatever of how his office hours made a difference for you, you know, and so the, you know, a testimonial of what that looks like, um, as well as a, um, you know, potentially, you know, just things that you like about it or th the, th the memories that you had with it. And I think that we're going to, we're thinking about those things. And so we're looking for suggestions on, you know, what types of content uh, that we might want to do there. Go ahead, Bill, real quick. Yeah, I just wondered how far back we have actual show content uh, into the early days. I know. Yeah. We have it all, um, oh. or we have most of it. Uh, so I think that if you, what would be easiest is if in YouTube, if you know where it is, go back and give us the, you know, when you do the share, share to the moment, you know, so it'll give you the T equals um, certain number of seconds. It would be the, um, uh, I think that sending us something that's very specific in YouTube from when the time we started putting it on YouTube is really makes it easy for us to find for an edit. But I think that there's also moments that happened before that, that if you just tell us, I, it was the moment when we did this. And we might have to think about, if you can think about the date, that's great. Um, you know, some of the, uh, the emails that went out might give you a sense of it. You might be able to search for what that was and get close to the date and we can find it. Um, the, uh, I think that between John and I, John Preto and I, I think we probably have all the episodes. So we could probably go back and find those, um, those episodes and try to find those clips. They're not easy to find. The YouTube stuff's easy to find or easy-ish. The, um, the earlier stuff is a little bit rough. I do have, um, I do have episode one <laughs> you know, that's there. And it's funny because I was reading, I, I was putting it together. Uh, you know, we got shown a little bit on, uh, you know, during Zoomtopia, you know, and there was, I had to give Andy some clips. So I had to run back and grab some stuff and he didn't use all of it. But one of the funny things was, is I was, I said at the beginning on the very first episode, I was like, well, I'm trying to figure this out because I might have to deal with Zooms that have 50 or 60 people. Like that was a big number. <laughs> like I have to deal with it, you know? <laughs> and so I figured I better start figuring out how to do this. And it was just a great, so I think that there'll be some fun quotes that we can go back and find, um, you know, in those areas. Uh, one thing we will, yeah, yeah. So go ahead, uh, Mitchell. The one thing that would be helpful is we're barely a month out from this event. Um, ideas are appreciated, but finished pieces would be more appreciated. And don't worry about editing things too much. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's what I would really look at is, you know, I think that, and Josh can underline, I think we had, we talked about this a little bit over this week is, you know, a third, you know, 30 seconds of this is what made a difference. This is why office hours makes a difference for me. Um, thinking about 15 second clips that we might cut to that, that shows something. Um, but really pithy and don't worry about putting a ton of production into it. Let us figure out how that's going to look inside of that. I wouldn't build videos um, because the problem is that they may not look like everything else we're doing. So, but, but we would love to get, keep it easy and have people be able to send us some video footage. Um, that is, um, you know, Josh, what were the subjects we were talking about um, that we were going to encourage people to do? One was how, 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 how has office hours made a difference? What were the, I think there was another one that we were talking about there. Um, um, yeah, we were talking about, um, so how has office hours affected you? How did you find it? Mm -hmm. Um, different personal experiences. I think having testimonials is helpful for us to tell our story and it, 
it um it it's great for people on the outside that that don't know anything about the shows. Well, but I think it would also be interesting for folks on the inside uh, uh, and on testimony. And again, I just wanted to be like a really short thing. It'd be interesting to see, for us to know how it makes a difference for different people. You know, it's, it is because I think it's different for everybody. Like this is why it, this, because of what I would love to use that for is this is why, this is why office hours is important to me. And if it's not, then don't send us a video. But, but if it, if it is, if it is important to you, like say this is, and, and to maybe talk about your favorite things, we might send out a couple different questions that we encourage people to use their phone or use their webcam or use their camera, but not, um, you know, I think that that is, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think that, I think that that would be, we'll, we'll, we'll and we're going to get these questions out pretty quickly. We're going to figure it out over the next couple of days because, um, I don't know what Josh is pointing towards. I, I think that probably our cutoff will be probably, so start thinking about these kinds of things because I think our cutoff is going to be like December 2nd, you know, so that's a couple of weeks from now. And mostly because we need time to edit, you know, everything together and figure out, know what we have. So, you know, keep these kind of things thinking, um, you know, kind of churning in your head there. Go ahead, Josh. So, and, and that's something that we can submit right now. Um, if there's a type of testimonial that you have thought of, put it in kind of questions now and have us consider it. And then we're going to work on that for the next mm -hmm. four weeks or so. We're looking at how we're going to ingest uh, your contributions, a couple of different ideas, suggestions on that. This is our planning show. So we're, we're thinking about that now. We're not telling you how it's going to be. We're asking you, what, what do you want to see? So well, yeah, and, and definitely let us know. And, and, and the other thing is, I mean, one, I think there's a couple different questions that we could put out there. And now that I'm thinking about it, we uh, also like, where do you think it's going to be at episode 2000? You know, like, like what is your, or what, what would you want it to be in episode 2000? I think would be an interesting uh, conversation. Go ahead, Josh. So we did have um, segments. I think maybe that's what mm -hmm. you're thinking about, um, Alex. We, we had some, um, some pre-curated segments of what we can have. We're thinking about maybe a half dozen or so different segments, and maybe we'll compete these uh, against each other to see what happened. Here's just an example um, of different segments that we have. Uh, let me pull it up here. So um, uh, office hours adjacent shows. So we have the Tony Mobley show, Belfast Method, all of our Belfast Method. So all of the, the office hours adjacent things are after hours. Uh, things that happen in after hours specifically, and then separately, labs, uh, education, some of the things we've had there. Uh, we have, we talked about our testimonials, um, humor segments, you know, anecdotes. Um, if you can keep them pithy and uh, interesting, that would be great. Nostalgic uh, sentiments, you know, some uh, relationships or people that we've had or, or experiences are 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 awesome. Tech new. Uh, technology evolution. So we've gone from webinar from 1.0 to 2.0 to 2.5. How did office hours look and feel through these? Um, some of the behind the scenes, um, a lot of our production crew and the things that people do, little things that get done that we just take for granted. You know, how is it the, the engine that keeps office hours working? Um, we have John Preto with us. And so uh, records and statistics. Are things you know um, tabulating different uh, uh, options? Maybe John can talk about some of the things that he's kept track of. But there's some things we can actually go after the fact and go back and look at and tabulate. You know how many people, how many people have come through here, how many questions we've had, or whatever. Some of those things, if, if we weren't keeping track, John, I know John's been uh, keeping a, a pulse on that, that throughout the show. But some things, if we're detectives and we can do some of the legwork or find the links, like we did. Uh, we can do that. And one of the other um, segments that we are looking at is the future, the future of Office Hours. So we're celebrating a thousand shows, but also, like Alex said, you know, what will the 2000th show look like? Next question. Next question from Stefan Fischer, Wurzburg, Germany. How about having all the people on the panel that take care of the show to run and let them say what they do? Go ahead, Dave. Well, that's a suggestion that that is quite popular um, because it is a mystery. Who's in the back and what do they do? Uh, I think if he meant panel, I think he means the the folks in the back end. Uh, it, it seems to me that, that we're going to have shy people who don't want to be on, but we may be able to persuade them to do a sort of pre-recorded segment, and then we can string together a bunch for us to be able to see everybody saying something about what they do. So yeah. that's a suggestion we're looking into. 
Absolutely. Next question. J.J. McKenna in San Rafael, California, ask for a show like this, not that there are many, what is a precedent for clip length of memory segments? Go ahead, Dave. Well, we're looking at 30 seconds. Um, if you can't say it in 30 seconds and it's really important, then we may stretch you to 60. But uh, we're hoping that we don't accumulate so many of these that it takes away from having panel discussions. So we don't want it to be a series of, you know, background clips like a, a retrospective or something. But we want to have conversations about how it's changed and how people use it and that sort of thing. So in, in terms of what people are suggesting, for which I have more than 22 currently suggested items, uh, we're looking at condensing things. So if a clip a suggested clip, for instance, runs for three minutes, uh, the editors will have a chance to sort of shrink it or make a, uh, almost a super cut of it instead of showing the whole darn thing. But we're also wanting to be able to show long things like a, a musical performance or something where we just fade the audio down and let people talk about how great that was. So that's the concept of what we're doing. Uh, in terms of length, it's just going to depend on how compelling the content is. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, I think the shorter the better. Uh, if you can do it in 10 seconds, do it in 10 seconds because it could become very tedious after a while to hear one testimonial after no, no, another. No, it's not going to be like that. I, I don't think that, I think that, you know, there'll be, a, you know, we'll pepper those, a lot of that stuff through. It won't be at one after the other. Um, and then the other thing is, is that when I think JJ's asking specifically about, uh, mem you know, pre clip memory for memory segments and those could be, you know, we can figure out what they make sense of. I also think we were talking about the other day, uh, compiling all the happy birthdays. So we have to think about what happy birthdays there are, but but just keep cutting between them all because it'll all sound like a train wreck. <laughs> but, but seeing them all like a couple, you know, each verse or each couple pieces of, of uh, thing being a different one would be uh, would be kind of fun. So I you think could, uh, kind of yeah, fun. you could sing it once and just cut to different people who celebrated a birthday. <laughs> I realize while we've been with Logan, they should, we should do a, uh, you know, the, the, whatever someone looked like right at the very beginning, you know, welcome to office hours, da, 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 and just cut through it. It'd be like that person who puts his camera out and just captures, you know, like six years with this person. You'd see all these backgrounds and then different people jumping in and, and then, you know, all the backgrounds and changes and, and the fact that my, that I don't cut my hair very often, you know, that, that, all that would, that would make a difference there. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Uh, one, one of the other things I was thinking about are, are, uh, awards like most improved panelist, etc. Yeah, we should do some awards. It'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, next question. Best reader. Anyhow, uh, excuse me. Uh, next question from Douglas Carmichael. What would you think of a back end view option similar to conversations with Tony Mobley back uh, behind the scenes uh, breakout room where viewers can see the show from the back end's point of view with comms? This could be a powerful tool for building viewership and recruiting new volunteers. I think it's definitely something that we're planning to do in general as we move forward. I, I don't know if we'll get it done for the show or not, but but it's definitely a, it's it's on the hopper to to do um, as as we move forward. Next question. Liberty White's here with a question uh, from Toronto, Ontario. By the way, what are your thoughts on a slideshow of members at work in the field? Maybe that could help reflect those who contribute but aren't on the panel. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Maybe we could hire uh, Chuck Braverman, who did that American Time Capsule, if you remember that film, to a drum track, and he cut together the entire history of America in two and a half minutes. He could cut together clips for us. He's still around. He lives in Hollywood. I know Chuck. He's a good guy. That'd be good. Uh, yeah, and, and the um, I think that there'll be some, with a lot of this stuff, what's nice about this as we think about these these segments is that there'll be some little interstitials that are, you know, that we're just gonna, we can play some um, time lapses or or we can play some uh, slideshows or this is where we put some of the testimonials. So the top, you know, the end of one segment going to another, and there might be a couple minutes that lets people, you know, stretch their legs and do their thing and, and then come back. So there may be, a, a, we may be using a lot of those things that we're talking about here as those spacers in between things, just to give people five or 10 minutes to, kind of stretch out and do something and then come back and have another conversation. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, this has been a popular thing because everyone's curious about, you know, how things are running and different people's participation. Um, of course, it'd be voluntary, but let us know um, in the discussion thread about how you actually would like to have that, you know, a little slideshow, different people con contributing their clips, um, how we might be able to move that segment. Next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas asked, in the 1,000th show, can you show clips of Makana and how it works? Clips of panel view. Probably not. 
<laughs> Next question. Next question from Liberty White in Toronto, Ontario. What makes a good testimonial video? How long and what the keywords would be? I think the testimonial video, 15 to 30 seconds, is what we're really looking for. So you really have to think about how to keep it pithy. Otherwise, it'll get to be really long, as, as was said before. I don't think you can do it in less than 15 seconds. I don't think you need more than 30 to just say what, what, how it really you know, made a difference. And we may talk about some of the things a little bit longer in the show, but I think that, uh, that I think that the, that that's a good, a target for us. Um, as far as that goes, go ahead, Josh. Something that might be helpful is thinking about what themes, uh, you might want to contribute to. So what we talked about a few of them, what office hours means to you, um, different anecdotes or things like that, but maybe think up some topics about what we want, uh, people to theme their testimonial videos off of. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, what would you think of reaching out to name YouTubers like Adam Savage to co-promote the show on their channels? Go ahead, Dave. Well, that's an interesting suggestion. And it's one that we came up with very early is to find some of the people who have actually been guests on our show or some special people who've appeared, such as uh, Graham Kerr and that sort of stuff. And just reach back to them and see if they'd like to send us uh, 15 or 30 seconds of a greeting. Um, I don't, I don't know if it'll generate a whole lot of conversation after those greetings. So we're thinking of using generic greetings or congratulations messages, uh, as a sort of break between the theme segments. So we'll be looking for them and maybe reaching out to a few people and contribute to the discussion in the discord, uh, the, uh, OH killer show discussion and, uh, put in names of people you remember were, were on the show and then maybe we'll be able to get back to them. And, and to be clear, the way I view the show is this is our show. I'm not trying to use it as a promotion. Like, I don't really care. Like, you know, like, I don't care if more people watch this one than any other one. It's really for us to celebrate what we're doing here and for our members to, uh, or, or, you know, the producers and, and the panelists and everything else. I'm not trying to make this a PR show. Like, it's, I don't care if any more people watch it. I don't want to even think about that. Like, all I want to think about is that we've all done this thing for a thousand shows and we're going to get together and talk about it and have a good time talking about it, but I actually would prefer not to promote it externally any more than we normally do. Um, so that really only the people that really care are here. <laughs> so go ahead, Mitchell. But maybe there, he's onto something here. Maybe it'd be fun to have some celebrities to pop on and say, Hey, congratulations on your one and maybe some videos. show. And maybe some people that have been on the yeah. show in the past just to, you know, that would be fun. Like to, some yeah. congratulations, especially quick. from folks just real quick, quick like, Hey, this is da, 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 da. Congratulations to a thousand shows. And those are the kind of things that we can kind of sprinkle in, um, to the, yeah. you know, to the I could go yeah. to cameo and grab a few, uh, Hollywood celebrities <laughs> pop them in there. Fun. We had one for, what was our one, was it our one year anniversary that I, we can't say, don't say it on the panel, like who it was, but we had somebody that would be great. It'd be great if we had, anyway, so, but anyway, that's, that's, um, 600th that show. Oh, was it 600th show? Oh my gosh. That was so funny. Anyway, it was, it was definitely for me, the one thing that I definitely remember that we can't talk about. All right. All right. Next question. Next question from, why can't we talk? Okay. Anyhow, uh, next question is from JJ McKenna, Santa Venetia, California. Is there any consideration of creating an overall story arc for the show with particular themes at a certain time rather than an organic emotional roller coaster? Well, we are looking at having themes. What I will say is that what I we did talk about a little bit this week is I don't want it to be constrained to time. So so I I, I want us to have we're going to have some things that we want to talk about. Um, and it, it will be it, in our own special way, it will be very ADD and bounce around and, and we'll have lots of conversations that aren't necessarily, you know, it'll move all over the place because that's what we do. But, but it will, but we will have some ideas of these are the things we're talking about. What it won't be is this is at nine and this is at 10 and this is at 11. You know, we're going to chew on something. What we want to do is find a way to tell everyone when the next thing is happening, but it's not going to be necessarily um, pinned to a time. Go ahead, Josh. And we spoke about, um, we want to keep the audience involved in it. That's why we're not looking to just roll a bunch of clips after clips. And then, you know, the audience disengages. We want to get, we want to make things spontaneous and allow people to contribute in the moment too. But we also want to take these next four weeks and prepare things that belong in certain spots 
that we can reference. So a segment would have its Mukana tag that people could comment on that segment. And it would also have, you know, like, for example, if we had some musical segments, you know, um, having that content for that segment and then also having that tag so that our producers at home can feel like they're still part of the show. You got it, Bill. I suggest the show starts with Courtney saying, in a world where the pandemic is ravaging technology, and go on from there. <laughs> um, yeah, and the uh, and Mickey uh, and, and the things that how about a con an actual conversation instead of a quote unquote a show? And I'm fine with having it be much more freewheeling on that on that day. So that that'll be fine. Um, next question. Colin McCaughey from Dublin, Ireland asks, congratulations on the upcoming landmark event. The community has been a great comfort and a resource to me after being so isolated while working with COVID. Good, Dave. Colin, that's the sort of dedicated response we're looking for. And if you've got a way to put it on video and push it into our system, we'll find you and put you in the show saying that. Yeah, and one thing to know is that yeah, it won't be one long solid thing of all the thing, all the videos that that we have there. It'll be you know we'll sw just little bits and pieces here and there um, as we continue to have a conversation together. Um, next question, Keenan Campbell, Nevada, USA. How do we submit videos, episode segments, videos, etc.? Go ahead, Dave. Well, the first way we're allowing you to do that is in the OH Discord discussion for Kill a Show. And uh, you can post your suggestion there. And if you've got a link to a YouTube video that you know of, then put in that with its time. And then we'll search it out and bring in the clip. Uh, we're going to be collecting a lot of these. I've got a growing list already. And then we're just going to make an evaluation where we'll put all those suggestions into a voting Discord and allow people to up and down fund them as to what they think is a better show to include. Good. And we'll see if that helps us make our selections or just creates confusion. But uh, we, we hope to have a very long list to draw from, and it'll be a lot of work to pull them all down and sort them and get them into groups and maybe make super cuts of some of the things, uh, you know, such as, you know, some people have been suggesting birthdays, for instance. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, what we might have too is a specific, I mean, we could have it right inside the, the discussion thread there where if you can host something on your Dropbox or on your own drive, you can leave the link there for things that you have that are not hosted. Uh, and we've used before uh, different services like WeTransfer, just giving a little tutorial about how you can send up to two gigabytes into different places. So keep, uh, keep an eye on the um, discussion thread about how we can contribute. And we don't need it to be two gigabytes. <laughs> so, so you can, you can, H264 will be fine. That's all I'm saying. You don't have to send us Apple ProRes 4444 uh, with alpha channels. It's not necessary. Uh, next question. From Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA, here on our panel. What award segments might we have for the 1000th show? For example, most improved panelist, most frequent commenter, most best attendance on the panel, most dollars and recommended purchases, et cetera. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Most red flags from Alex, uh, most often unmuted, et cetera. <laughs> that, that would be rich. So anyway, yeah, so the, um, uh, uh, the, I, I think I think that we should just try to make them mostly fun. That's all I would say is I, I wouldn't try to do anything that would really requires lots of um, study to find that. Although I, I would like best attendance would be, would be fun to see who, like I would love to see the top 10 of like who. I, uh, I have it done. Okay, excellent, excellent. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, all right, uh, next question. Next question from Joe Phillips in Murphy, North Carolina. How about we invite an official Guinness World Records judge, an educator, into the show and make the record attempt? I don't know. I don't know what record attempt we would make. Like, or like, what would be what what? what we're, we've done well, but I don't think a thousand episodes. I mean, I think that we're way behind. You know, other shows that are in the tens of thousands. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, the process of getting Guinness Book of Records involved is is a many month process. So we'd have to submit a reason and proof and we uh, should statistics to prove that we are the longest running, and we'd have to be able to prove to them there isn't somebody else who's been doing it longer. Yeah, it would have to be the longest running, the longest continuous, continuous running Zoom uh, meeting. I think that would be yes. the you you would have to um you know I think that would be the thing that that we could probably get there is because but you have to be very specific to that's how the guinness books work um, so when we get to 2000 
we might be able to apply for. Oh, I think that we're probably the longest running daily show on Zoom ever now. Right now, yes. Yeah, like I think that that would be, and mm -hmm. it, and it would be hard to catch up because we just keep making the record every day. <laughs> So it's, it's a new record. It's a new record. beat us by accelerating time. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard thing. Is it's not even a, it's not even like we got there. It's like, well, we were there and now we're here. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, if you include the after hours minutes, uh, that's definitely the longest running show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but even even just a continuous you know show that we do for office hours, I don't think there's anything else that's met anybody else that's met with this many people for this many days. Um, inside of Zoom, what we what we ought to do is get Zoom involved, so they get a little. It's, that's how Guinness. I don't want to ruin it for everybody, but that's how Guinness works. <laughs> like we get get a big corporation involved that needs to get that that wants to do a PR release and then talk to them and then talk to you know that you got to figure something out. I probably just ruined our chances of getting a Guinness record. All right, next, I've done some stuff there. Anyway, next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, USA. What words could we search in the subtitles of previous episodes? To create a fun clip. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, for those of you who haven't seen it before, there's a, a website called Filmot who uh, they took a petabyte of uh, subtitles and uploaded them and you can search through them. And so for uh, Alex's old channel, if you search in that channel, something like muted, you'll see it, we got 39 clips, th three times that word was said in this clip. And you can just go through... Uh, each time that it was said, so you could have uh, can't hear you, the can't one that hear you, can't 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 hear you. Or here's uh, next question. So you know, eighty-seven uh, clips the found, off. forty-eight. Yeah. So, so you could just imagine next question, just two second bites of next question. So you could see all the subtitles here on the right. But yeah, you just hit next clip, uh, next clip, and it just keeps finding. The word dumpster fire, question. dumpster fire, dumpster fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'd be a fun one. <laughs> we had a mode when we were in dumpster fire there. Yeah, would <laughs> be good. That'd be good. Clean uh, show, clean show. Yeah, we don't have that many. We had a lot at the beginning where we people were being like pulled into clean show. And now it's, uh, I did find it. I, uh, I mean, this is more for the thousand show, but, but I did, uh, um, I find it interesting that we went through a lot of, uh, tense moments last week around politics and, didn't infect us pretty much at all, <laughs> which was which was good. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Kerfuffle. Um, never, ever, ever. Um, in fact, I think Mickey did one of those and he was going to put it to music, but uh, I don't think maybe he's saving it. I don't know. Uh, next question. Next question from Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois. Kyle asks, will the panel be locked for this episode show or do you anticipate panelists coming and going since the times are a little more fluid? Go ahead, Dave. We're exploring how to rotate in people and have time zone mm -hmm. considerations for some people. And we're not yet sure how that's going to manage. It's a bit of a load on the back end people to be replugging things in and rearranging the panel live. But we're, we're asking a lot of good questions to the tech people about whether we can do it. And we're, we're getting some positive responses. Uh, we wouldn't really lock the panel, but we would probably have uh, the usual suspects plus one or two we would invite in. I go ahead, uh, Josh. Yeah, what, what Dave said, um, you know, if, if we had a segment that had, for example, you know, a musical presentation, it might make sense to have those as panelists on. But uh, we'll look at technically what we can do with our back end, having our volunteers, uh, different roles that we can do, and work it from that side too. So um, stay tuned as far as panel. And I think that that's that's where we're, if we create these gaps with some of the folks saying, you know, saying what, you know, the videos and the time lapses and the other things, we can create these gaps where we can kind of let let some panelists leave, let other panelists come in. So and then, you know, so if people are interested in that, they can, you know, find those times. So I think that those will be kind of fun little moments where people can take a break. Um, some people can come, some people can go. I think that all, all of those things would be possible there. And that would give our back end also a little bit of time to, to you know, to get things sorted out um, and make sure that that's working. Uh, next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA, here on the panel. What type of sneak peek promotional material would the community like to see on the weeks leading up to the Kilo Show? Can we revisit the Kilo Show planning again for a second hour between now and December 19th? I think we definitely should. Um, you know, like, I think we should probably keep our eye on it. I think that um, I'm fine... I'm fine with uh, next 
Friday just talking about where we've kind of landed on it and give people kind of a guidance on what that looks like. So I think that next Friday we might want to have another meeting, talk about it. It might be short, like this one might be short because we don't have as many questions. <laughs> so, so it might be a shorter uh, touch base, but Friday, Thanksgiving weekend in the United States is probably okay. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, we did some night, well, uh, Dennis did some nice uh, promos for Super Saturday. And those were fun as promos leading up to the event. So maybe that's the kind of thing we could do a few of. Next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. Uh, what would you think of using a custom jam jingle package for the Kilo Show? Um, <laughs> look, I'm not a big, I'm not a big uh, uh, jingle person. Go ahead, Mitchell. I am, and I know John Wolfert real well at jam. So uh, maybe a couple of acapella things like, uh, you know, the winner or, you know, you're muted or whatever. Makes sense. Uh, the award show portion, some kind of little bumper they go into it. But it, it, it would be campy. I think that that's the way you sell it. You don't try to be serious. You just do it a little campy. Yeah. Uh, next question. Next question in from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh. Anticipating a very active chat for the Kilo Show, how can we involve the chat sentiments into the show? Uh, go ahead, Dave. Well, we're working on ways of, of opening that up more and having um, areas in the in the Mukana. There's the um, event chat, which people comment on what they're hearing and that sort of stuff. And we're going to have a, a coordinator set aside who watches that. And if there are any comments that we think are contributing to the panel discussion, uh, we'll push, push them to the host and show them to the panel and see if they want to take up that remark as well. We're also exploring whether or not some of these curated remarks will appear as almost a scroll along the bottom, uh, either as a question space or somewhere where this can be augmenting what's going on, where people are either cheering it along or adding in things that no one else thought of. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, what uh, Dave said, um, one thing we saw in the Zimtopia is they had an unmoderated uh, little yeah. uh, uh, that questions. Won't happen. <laughs> float up <laughs> right right so that's that has some definite uh, problems associated to it but there. um we're looking at the capabilities of what we could do to pop them on we're expecting a very busy one and the the host of the kilo show will be liberty it is on it is on a monday and typically she does um you know pull things out of the chat but we want her to be more focused you know more present in thing especially with the the flying chat so Having um, uh, someone or, or even team associated with that might open us up to some of the opportunities that Dave had mentioned. Uh, there are other tools in Makana that we haven't exposed that we could probably just turn on. Um, one of them is to be able to build a ticker across the bottom that, and then we can select specific uh, comments and push them into the ticker automatically. And that's already it's already working. It's been working for a couple of years. <laughs> so, so we can, we don't do it here because I think I find it would be a distraction on a general one, but it could be a fun thing for what we're doing here. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. How cool would it be to have somebody like James Earl Jones come in and read the names of the original guys, you know, <laughs> in a very dramatic reading? I think that would be so cool. We'll just see what we could do there. I, mean, I think having some, some fun with some of those would be kind of cool. Uh, next question. Next question from Guy Cochran. How about a few where are they now playouts? Uh, go ahead, Dave. I don't want to throw a wet blanket on this, but people are suggesting things that require pre-production and uh, long-term contact. And, and we, we could have playouts of something that, you know, where are they now? But they've got to agree to want to be in that. Yeah, but I think so, I think we can reach out to some folks that we know that are that if there's are some who can group. show us slides of where they are and what they do now. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like show your uh, setup on mm -hmm. Discord. It's people showing what they're up mm -hmm. to now, and if it's different because of OH, mm -hmm. it would be interesting. Go ahead, guy. Yeah, as I was going through that Filmot thing, I just pulled up you know just a random episode, and I'm like, oh yeah, Doug's working. He's got that fancy trailer. He's got to pay for, so he's got to work it. Chris, he's working it and a lot of the folks just they went back to work you know it's just it's pretty quick we could just go through and just circle with a telestrator just like hey um georgie kennedy he's happy to come around when he can but yeah he's busy boots on the ground he's in convention centers i see his mm -hmm. facebook posts he's he's rocking it and a lot of these guys are uh vipul i think that uh yeah the temple stuff's opened back up and they're just out there working yeah 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, maybe there is something on Discord we could sort of collate and then just take some of the pictures off Discord and, and share them. I do think that there's somewhere where we, we should do like roughly the first per time someone was on versus the where they are currently as a panelist just the transformation of how they look because <laughs> before and I, after split screen, like, no even no my, i'm my saying no to that <laughs> <laughs> my first one is just a disaster like it's like this like it's just like curtains like a gray curtain because I, I was like oh i gotta get this finished before because i had started building my studio before covid started so it wasn't I had been playing with it and trying to figure it all out, you know, so it wasn't, but it wasn't done. And I was like, oh, I got to get this done before I do it. And I was like, you know, I just got to do it. And so I just turned it on. And the first couple of weeks, if you look at my first ones, there was just a gray cloth that it was just kind of half hanging behind me sometimes. And sometimes it was clear and sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes it was whatever it was. And and then I went and I, I was keying something that I downloaded from iStock. And then I was keying something, then I was keying my living room. And then I was then I moved to the gray screen and you know, like there's like a lot of, a lot of, uh, but there's like sections of it. That's why I think it would be fun to have a time lapse of all the open frames because you just see all this, uh, you know, and then you'd see other people popping in and being host for a little while. And anyway, it'd be fun. I Go came in from the voice, but I don't think I said a word for the first three shows I was on. I just sat there. Yeah. <laughs> and stared at the camera. <laughs> Go ahead, Josh. We talked about this a little bit, you know, there's, there's many ways of bringing people into the show. You know, if they make testimonials, if they record mm -hmm. things for us, if we track them down into the archives of, you know, uh, their, mm -hmm. uh, the, the arc, the arc, the archive and, records. And I, think that, I think there's also like another, another subject that we could ask is like, what is your favorite thing about office hours? Like, what do you like the most the, um, about office hours? You can probably do what you miss the most too. <laughs> Like conversations, Mickey's, Mickey's. Like, uh, and that might be after hours. Some people like that more than the office hours. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, so I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of things to think about here. If, if we're only going to talk about this for another minute or two, um, and then we're going to move on if we don't have any more questions or comments, but it's fine. I think we've covered a lot of ground really fast. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, looking back, it's kind of funny to go back. If you go to your old channel and hit stream, scroll to the very bottom there, it looks like the first one is right here. Um, 914 views streamed two years ago. So there's the one on, the folks on are. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And here's yeah, the crew. It was, the it was, here's, it was. here's day three screenshot, Alex. That's that living room that you had keyed. And did we? Oh, because you did a screenshot. Because the one thing I will say about my recordings, so yours, yours will be more interesting in a lot of ways because my recordings, um, uh, Interesting. Yeah. The recordings themselves are, are all, none of them have gallery view because that's how I had it recorded. I just had a recorded active speaker. So like a lot of the old recordings are just that you don't see any gallery there. I've anyway. got a bunch of screenshots too. Do Is there a portal that we can just dump them all so that uh, the Josh, crew in the background, talk to Josh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Mitchell. I just searching cameo. Brian Cox is available to do dramatic reads. So that would be fun. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so um, let's, uh, I, I think these, this gives everybody something to think about. We'll continue to talk about it in Discord um, and uh, think, but start thinking about the things you might want to send a video in around um, to, uh, to be part of the show if you're, if you're interested in that. Um, thanks to all the, uh, thanks to all the producers for all the great questions and, and, uh, and suggestions and just keep your eye out for more information about that. We'll be sending more out early next week and then we'll talk about it again next Friday. But assume that we're going to ask you to get everything in by December 2nd. So, so start thinking about it now. Um, and uh, we wanted to let you know about some of this stuff before, um, before we got to the Thanksgiving weekend. So people had a little time to think about it or play with the idea or whatever. We'll talk about it again on, on Friday. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll, and, we'll, and then we'll go from there. We'll, but December 2nd is when we're going to need everything. So if you're going to think about it, the next two weeks is the time to think about it. Um, next Friday, we'll have any kind of error correction. Now that you've had a week to think about it, um, what are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, like, what do you think we're, you know, we've just started the seed of this conversation. And so we'll discuss it again next Friday and, uh, and go from there. Um, but I think, it, I think it should be a fun show. I think we're going to have a good time with it on December 19th um, of this uh, year. So stay tuned for that. Thanks to uh, all of the producers um, for, uh, for all the great questions and suggestions over the last two hours. Uh, thanks to the, um, we covered um, 110,000 miles. We went total, we went uh, 1K on this one. 177,000 kilometers. So uh, that's the Tlaloc traversal. 
And um, and also thanks to the panelists. We can't do this without you. It's great, good conversation today. Covered a lot of ground really fast, so really well done. And um, and then finally, thanks to the to the great team in the back end making this happen every single day. Um, you know, it's just amazing the the amount of work from both the folks behind the scenes um, that are making all of this kind of pulling all this stuff together, as well as the panelists. I just want to you know, uh, it's great that we did Office Hours. 2.5 and 2.0, but I really want to call out the panelists who put all this time, effort, money, investment into looking great because it's part of what makes this show great is that it sounds good, it looks good. Um, I was talking to someone in engineering at a pretty big, pretty high company, big company, and they said whenever you want to talk about virtual meetings, they just they send people to our YouTube channel saying this is what it could be. You know, like this is what it could be if everyone was there. But that's not something that I'm doing. And that's not something that, that Office Hours is doing. It's something that the panelists are doing. And I just, I just really want to, um, you know, just really want to thank the panelists for playing so hard. So really, really, really good work. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump into After Hours. Courtney, I, I need to figure out how to get the signal into the oscilloscope. <laughs> channel one channel one okay. and if you want to put a this issue pattern you got to go into xy mode and do i is it do i just do rc like do i just do a unbalanced into it like what signal yeah, it's a bnc inputs on the front of that oh, okay okay but it's just unbalanced bnc going into, yeah. into that front area yep channel one definition and, and now convert voltage to one volt on the vertical <laughs> Yeah, that's gonna be so cool. All right, all right. That's all I gotta figure out. First, you gotta get power to it, though. Respond to your microphone. Right. Talk Great to discussion, you. guys. Talk to you later. Too much free time, Dave. <laughs>